Welcome to the second PowerProc 20 lecture. Today's topic is parallel computers and parallel computer architecture. Now, first of all, before we go into parallelism, we have to cover a little bit about single core computer architecture, because without that, it's not possible to really get insight into the performance properties of programs, be they parallel or not. So I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the main features of single core computer architecture. First of all, at the heart of every computer we are using today is the stored program computer concept, which is shown here. It was invented in the 30s of the 20th century, and it comprises a surprisingly small um, collection of components. There's a so-called control unit and arithmetic logic unit, which do the actual work. It is the purpose of the control unit to read instructions from memory. These instructions are encoded as simple numbers usually organized in bytes or words or quad words or whatever. As a consequence of interpreting those instructions, the arithmetic logic unit obtains data from memory and performs operations on that data. Probably more data is then written back to memory. And of course, we need some input-output hardware to get the results out of the system. Nobody has come up with a more powerful and more flexible concept. So starting from the first computers that actually used the stored program computer concept, like the EDSAC in 1949, um, via typical home computer and business computer systems, which we had in the 70s and 80s, even supercomputers and even your iPhone, all of those use the stored program computer concept. The main performance limitation, the thing that usually limits um, the performance of executing programs on such a computer is memory access. Memory is usually something that can be obtained or can be built in very large quantities. However, compared to anything that happens within the core, within the arithmetic logic unit or the control unit, memory tends to be slow because it's connected via wires and wires are much slower than um, connections on the chip. So if we talk about performance and how fast things can run, we need to talk about the basic resources a computer provides. Usually I ask the question, what is the purpose of a computer? And the basic purpose, the main purpose of a computer is instruction execution. Instructions are the primary resource of the processor. When a computer architect designs a new processor, their main goal is to make instruction execution as fast as possible. So processor designers use instructions as their main metric of work. However, you as a programmer, as a developer in scientific computing, you don't actually care about instructions. You care about actual work. And often, actual work, as we discussed last time, is flops or any other metric that's relevant in your context, in your algorithm. So when we look at a simple algorithm, like for adding two arrays A and B, sorry for the Fortran code here, um, there's a loop with length n, and we um, add element by element the entries of vectors a and b and store the result back into vector a. Now, what's going on here from the point of view of a developer, like a programmer? The developer sees a certain amount of work in this code, and the amount of work is very easy to obtain. It's just the n flops, the n adds that we have to perform here. So our user work is n adds, and we'd like to perform this work as fast as possible. A computer architect's point of view, however, is different. A computer architect looks at work in terms of processor work or instructions. Now, which instructions does the processor have to execute in order to make this loop happen? Now, first of all, we're talking about um, architectures here which need to load data from memory explicitly. So in order to get hold of an entry of array A, we need to load it using an instruction in the machine language. So we load A of I into some register, uh, high-speed storage on the core, um, and this is one instruction, load R1 equals A of I. We need also to load um, B of I into R2, and once we've got those two values inside the CPU, we can add them using the actual add instruction. That's what's relevant for you as a programmer. That's what work really is. But for a computer architect, it's just one part of a bigger picture. 
Then once the add is complete, once the addition has been done, the result can be stored back into A of I. And after that, we need what we call loop mechanics. The loop counter must be incremented. There's a branch instruction, a conditional branch that checks whether the loop counter has already, already reached the limit. And if it hasn't, uh, it branches to the top. And if it has, it exits the loop. Now, of course, executing instructions alone doesn't help you to get your problem done. Um, it's the secondary resource that actually makes the computer work. And the secondary resource is a consequence of instruction execution. And this is data transfer. Now, how fast data can be transferred is determined by uh, the bandwidth, the maximum bandwidth the system can provide. Now, let's look at our example again, and let's count how much data traffic the execution of this program causes. So let's assume the data comes from main memory. We have two arrays A and B, which are double precision um, arrays. So first of all, for loading A of I, we have to spend eight bytes for data traffic. Loading B of I, another eight bytes, and storing back the result costs another eight bytes. So for a single iteration of this loop, we have to spend a data traffic of 24 bytes. And that's for one flop of work. OK, now there comes the crucial question. And it's one question that we'll, re we'll uh, revisit from time to time, although that's not the, the, the core of this course. But it's a really important question. Um, what determines the runtime? Is the data transfer the thing that limits the runtime? Is it the code execution? Is it the actual work, like the add, or something entirely different? Okay, that's a very important question. It turns out that in many cases, there is one single bottleneck. And more often than not, it is the data transfer, but not always. And um, we'll, have, we'll have to come back to that later. Of course, we want our general purpose um, computer to execute our in, uh, instructions, our programs as fast as possible. So what are typical measures that computer architects employ to improve the performance? And we will cover some of them in more detail in the following slides. So I'm giving you a quick overview here. Um, the first measure is pipeline instruction execution, which means each instruction is split into smaller um, parts, which can be executed in a parallel way. Instructions can be executed in a different order than uh, that in which they are laid out in the program. This is called out-of-order execution. And of course, the semantics of the program is uh, observed if we do that. Instructions themselves can be inherently parallel, working on several um, data items at once. This is called single instruction multiple data, or SIMD. And finally, I told you that uh, data transfer is often a bottleneck in computing. Caches are used, which store data, uh, which is used frequently for quick reference. Now, if you look at a part of this stop program computer uh, concept, namely the ALU, the control unit and part of the memory, we can give uh, a rough overview. And don't look into too much detail here. Uh, this is not the point of this course uh, to go into the details of CPU architecture. However, I want to go quickly over this diagram, showing you what is actually happening when a modern CPU core executes instructions, and which measures uh, to, to which lengths the architectures go to, to make this happen as fast as possible. So first of all, um, instructions are not read from memory directly, but from an instruction cache that holds often used instructions, recent instructions, maybe all the instructions that comprise a loop that we're currently executing. We have a couple of decoders that take the instructions, take these numbers, and decode them. So they figure out what should be done for every single instruction. There's a number of them, typically four, six, or even more. So we can do decoding already in parallel. Then the decoded instructions are put into a so-called reorder buffer and a scheduler. So here it's, uh, here it's decided when an instruction comes to execute. And in, in general, one can say that an instruction gets executed whenever its arguments are available. So whenever, for example, a load instruction that precedes an arithmetic instruction has been finished. After that, so once it's decided that instructions should be executed, they are sorted into so-called ports. And behind those ports, this is the place where the actual work is being done. So here we have multiply units, add units, load and store units, 
address calculation units, uh, integer computation units, jump branching, shifting, masking, whatever you have to do, whatever they have to provide um, in a microprocessor here. So here's what where the work is being done. Now, unsurprisingly, probably, this is just a minor part of the area of a modern microprocessor chip. It's a couple of percent. It's really a small part of the full chip. All the other stuff, all the other transistors are spent for this really complex logic for interpreting instructions and, of course, for storing data in caches. Of course, in order to get data out of the system and into it, we have to have some memory control and the, the core itself only talks to a small, fast memory on chip, which is the L1 data cache, the level 1 data cache. We'll come back to, uh, about to caches later uh, today. So this is the basic architectural principle, and it's quite generic, actually. It was motivated by a, a specific Intel processor, which appeared about 10 years ago, but it's actually valid for many, many standard processor designs today. Now let's look at the four most important in-core features, not counting cache, that are relevant for speeding up code execution. The first is pipelining. The second is superscalarity. The third is single instruction, multiple data. And the fourth is simultaneous multi-threading. Pipelining of functional units is an old idea. So it came... Uh, to life already in the dawn of computing in the 40s and 50s. And um, the idea is to split a complex instruction, an instruction that does a very complicated thing, into sem several simple but fast steps, or so-called stages. Now, the, the theory is that each of those stages takes the same amount of time, for example, a single clock cycle of the CPU. The, the idea behind the pipelining is now that different steps on different instructions can be executed at the same time in the pipeline, in parallel. That's why it's called a pipeline. So think about in that in terms of uh, conveyor belt construction of cars in a car factory, for example. That's very similar to that. So what's, what are the benefits? Of course, the good thing is a core can work on several independent instructions simultaneously at the same time. And when the pipeline is filled, as you will see on the next slide, one instruction can be finished every cycle which is good. However, there's also drawbacks. The pipeline must be filled. So uh, first of all, you have to spend a couple of cycles until the first instruction has moved through the pipeline. So that's when the first result comes out. And before that, nothing happens. So there's some, some dead time, some latency that has to be uh, covered. And of course, in order for it to work perfectly, the hardware must support it in many different ways, and one way to support it is out-of-order execution, which is done by the hardware, or software pipelining, which is done by the compiler. So um, despite its drawbacks, um, because of its great benefits, pipelining is widely used in modern architecture. So there's no computer today that does not have pipelining. So here's a simple picture of a multiply pipeline. And I do not know uh, whether these are the actual five steps that are used in a processor to implement the pipeline. But uh, five cycles is a typical length for a multiply instruction. And we're not talking about integers here. We're talking about 64-bit floating point multiplications. What has to be done to multiply two 64-bit floating point numbers? First of all, we have to separate the mantissa from the exponent. Okay, We're talking about... Uh, half logarithmic representations, so there's a mantissa and an exponent. In order to multiply two numbers, the mantissas must be multiplied and the exponents must be added, so we have to separate them first. Then there's a stage for multiplying the mantissas, a stage for adding the exponents. Then finally, probably you know that a floating point number must be normalized. It has to start with one dot and then the mantissa, so this normalization has to be done. And finally, somebody has to insert the correct sign. Now, these five stages are what, what comprise our pipeline. And let's see what happens if we have a loop with a lot of instructions, a lot of um, iterations, one to n, each one executing a multiplication. Of course, there's other stuff involved here. As you know, they have to be load and store instructions. Let's not look into that. Let's only look at the multiply part of this complicated loop execution. So in the first cycle, 
the first pair of operands, B of 1 and C of 1, can enter the pipeline. And in this cycle, the mantissa and exponent of those two operands are separated. The other stages of the pipeline are empty because there's nothing to do. Okay? There's no work to be done. In the second cycle, the first pair of operands, B1 and C1, can move to the second stage and get their mantissas multiplied. While this is being done, the second pair of operands, B of 2 and C of 2, can enter the pipeline and get their mantissas and exponents separated. Now, of course, you see how this goes on um, step by step. And after five cycles, the pipeline is finally full. The last stage after five cycles has finished, so that's when the first multiplication result drops out of the pipeline. And we call this time the wind-up phase. It's four cycles, so it's one cycle less than the depth of the pipeline. After cycle number five, if there's enough independent instructions, we can work on five independent multiplications at the same time. And this goes on until, of course, we run out of work. Okay, In cycle n, the last pair of operands enters the pipeline, and five cycles later, the whole thing is gone. Overall, the time that this takes is n plus four cycles. So n, the number of iterations, plus the depth of the pipeline, number of stages, minus one. So the, the loss that we have here is called wind up and wind down phase. And it's easy to see that the smaller n, the shorter the loop, the larger the impact of the wind up and wind down phases. That's what I meant by um, the pipeline must be started um, and stopped at the end. And this is overhead, which might be significant if there's not enough independent work. Now, the pipeline was just one little cogwheel in a really big machine. So besides the functional units like multiplication, addition, and others, there's also a higher level instruction pipeline in place that fetches instructions from the instruction cache, decodes instructions, and executes them. So our execution stage that we just looked at with the five substages, this is just one part of this big, if you wish, meta pipeline. And of course, this is also a pipeline, which means in successive steps, multiple inst uh, one instruction can be fetched, while another one is decoded and another one is executed. So this meta pipeline is working concurrently with all the other pipeline executions that happen in the core. Now, of course, this only happens flawlessly if there are no branches. If there's a branch, so something has to be decided, it has to be decided where to go in the code, then this pipeline can be stalled and we get so-called pipeline bubbles. The processor tries to counteract that by speculatively executing instructions along the path that it thinks is the most probable one. There's a whole science behind branch prediction and processes have become very, very good at it. So uh, in scientific computing, usually um, mispredicting the actual path of execution is not a big problem. Each unit is pipeline itself, of course. So fetching, decoding is all pipelined. And pipelines can also be chained. So for example, in our previous example, in order to do a multiplication, we had to do two loads first to get the two operands from memory. So the load pipelines have to be chained to the multiply pipeline using the register as an intermediate storage. And needless to say, this is all automatic within the hardware of the processor. This meta pipeline of fetching, decoding, and executing, this can be done in parallel. So depending on how much resources the processor core provides for that, multiple instructions can be fetched, decoded, and executed. In this example, we see a four-way so-called superscalar processor. Superscalarity in processor uh, terms means that we can execute more than one independent instruction per cycle. Now, if it's four-way superscalar, it means that it can sustainedly execute four independent instructions every single cycle. And we're talking about cycles which are um, like a half or a third of the nanosecond here. So it's really, really fast. So M concurrent instructions per cycle means the processor is M-way superscalar. These numbers vary a little bit across architectures. So nowadays we are between three and six-way superscalar in modern architectures, and of these three or six instructions, typically two can be floating point instructions, the one that's, that we are interested in.
So here's an example. Um, I could do a load to an operand to get into the register. I could do a multiply and then an add on some registers already, um, which are already store, uh, filled with data, and then store back the result. And these things could be done in parallel on the processor core. The next um, hardware feature that we have to cover, although it's probably not so relevant for, for some of you, is simultaneous multi-threading. Now here's a high level picture of a modern processor. We have the execution units, the pipelines. These pipelines execute the actual work, loads, stores, multiplies, adds. And of course, pipelines are typically not filled completely. So the picture that we had about our multiply pipeline only holds perfectly if there's no delays somewhere else in the, in the process. So for example, if the, the CPU core has to wait for data from main memory, there's no way the pipeline can be filled completely. So this happens all the time that um, execution units are not filled completely, or just imagine a code that does not do any adds, just multiplies. This means that the add unit will be underutilized or not utilized at all. Everything else, the rest of the, of the CPU, can be fully used by these execution units, so the registers, the caches, and the main memory interface. Now, still we are left with this underutilization of the pipelines. And you see here the white boxes, this is what we call pipeline bubbles. These are actually wasted resources. So wouldn't it be nice if we could fill these pipeline bubbles, these empty spots, with useful work? And this is what simultaneous multithreading, SMT, or also called hyperthreading, is all about. In a two-way SMT processor, so uh, two-way is usually what Intel does and also AMD these days, a two-way SMT core can execute two programs concurrently. And this is not like, like time sharing as we had it in the, in the 70s already, where multiple programs execute at the same time by sharing time slices. So this is actual concurrent execution. The processor behaves as if it could actually execute two instruction streams, two programs. Now, for that to happen, almost nothing has to be duplicated. The cache is the same size, the memory interface hasn't, doesn't change. Uh, a little bit of hardware has to be spent for a second register set, because if I run two programs concurrently, each one of them has to be able to assume that it has control of all registers. So we need a second register set. And of course, we need some control logic to make this all happen. Now, if it works perfectly, then these white bubbles in the pipelines can be filled with work from the other thread. And the hardware is able within the pipeline to switch quickly on a cycle by cycle basis between threads. Now, if, if that works well, you could get up to a 2x improvement in throughput. So SMT is mainly a feature that increases the instruction throughput on the core level. It improves the utilization of the pipelines. Of course, other resources on the chip are unchanged, so it does not improve anything else like memory, access speed, or the cache sizes. Um, in, in effect, it could also backfire if you run two programs and both need some cache size, but the cache is only one size, it doesn't grow, then it might be that the, the, the throughput is actually lower because your working set exceeds the cache size. And of course, this is all on the user side. So this is not automatic. You need to run multiple processes on multiple execution threads. So it's your turn, your work as a programmer to make this happen. If you don't have a parallel program, this will not work. The last topic I'd like to address is SIMD processing, single instruction, multiple data. It's in a sense orthogonal to pipelining because it's not concerned with how instructions are executed, but how work is executed in a single instruction. So SIMD allows the execution of the same operation on wide registers using single instructions. Here's how this um, could look like on a modern processor. We have a, a wide register. Let's, let's make it 256 bits. One slot in this register is 64 bits, so it holds a double precision number. Now in regular, we call it scalar execution, we can add two operands, 64-bit operands, and get a result um, of a third 64-bit uh, number. Now, if we only use the lowest slot, this is called scalar execution. And if we execute normal scalar code, this is exactly what happens. However, 
in SIMD execution, we can actually use the full width of the register. It's 256 bits wide, so it can hold four 64-bit operands. Now, there's a special instruction now, a so-called vectorized add. In this pseudocode, we call it v64 add, that can look at all those four operands in two distinct registers, add them in a single instruction, and thus produce four results in a single instruction. It's like you had four parallel pipelines all working in unison. Now, this is great because it improves the maximum performance of your, um, of your processor by a factor of four. Now, in the x86 Intel AMD processor world, there have been a lot of different instruction set extensions that implement such SIMD execution. The first one, well, actually not the first one, but the first one relevant for scientific computing was SSE which featured a register width of 128 bits, so two double precision floating point operands, which doubled the peak performance of the CPU. AVX, which appeared around 2011-2012, doubled the register width to 256 bits, so we could now store and operate on four double precision floating point operands. And since a couple of years, we have now AVX 512, and of course, you guessed it, they doubled the register width again to 512 bits. So now we can operate on eight double precision operands. And if you go down to single precision, which requires only 32 bits per operand, the number of operands per register doubles again. So 16 operands per register for AVX 512. All modern Intel CPUs can uh, do support this AVX 512 instruction set. Well, actually, if you take it seriously, if you read the term SIMD, it's not really specified if these four operations in this example are actually concurrent. They could also be pipelined, sent to the same pipeline, which was actually the case for the, for the earliest SIMD computers. However, on modern standard CPUs, desktop and server CPUs, they mostly are. So if you do a four-way SIMD add, these are actually four independent pipelines working concurrently to give you four times the maximum performance. To clarify this, here's another um, comparison between scalar and SIMD execution. We have two arrays, a source arrays and one target array. We want to add these two to get the target array. This is our code, a of j equals b of j plus c of j. Now here we have a picture of scalar or non SIMD execution. We work through those arrays element by element. We do an add element by element. We store the result back into memory. So one iteration is one add instruction and we plow through the data one element after another. Now in data parallel or SIMD execution, we usually have a choice as to which instruction set we want to use if the CPU supports it. So two operands in double position, that's SSE, actually SSE2, four operands AVX and eight operands AVX 512. So in this animation, I've chosen a SIMD width of four operands, which means every time we need data uh, in the register, we have to load it. And of course, also the load instructions are SIMD um, capable. So we have a load instruction that actually loads all four operands, consecutive operands, into a wide register. We do this for both arrays. Once we have those two registers filled, we can execute a SIMD add to get the result. And then there's a SIMD store, which stores the result back into the cache. And we do that and go on consecutively, but now in packets of four and not in single, in, in single iterations. Now, you may ask, who's doing this? Who's responsible for this? And if all works well, this is done for you by the compiler. If the compiler understands what your code is doing, then SIMD is pretty automatic. So here's a description of the steps the compiler has to go through to make SIMD happen. And it's self-evident that the compiler first has to understand that the iterations of your loop are independent. If there's any dependency from iteration i into iteration i plus one, it's not possible to do the SIMD thing because the dependency just rules out parallel execution. So the compiler has to recognize this first. And then the compiler does something called loop unrolling. It writes the loop in a more complicated way, although it's semantically equivalent to the first version. It unrolls the loop, so it makes the loop body, duplicates the loop body several times, here it's four times, and writes, it just advances the index from copy to copy, 
And of course, in the uh, loop mechanics now, the loop counter has to advance by four. And of course, if the uh, length of the loop is not a multiple of four, there is probably a remainder loop, which we omit here for, for brevity. So this is the starting point now for SIMD vectorization. And here you see that this actually is quite straightforward because now we see how we could employ load instructions to load four consecutive elements of B and four consecutive elements of A, then use a SIMD add to add them and store them back with another SIMD store. This is exactly what is done by the compiler. Do not do this by hand. I cannot stress this enough. There's a lot of scientific computing codes out there that try to help the compiler by doing this optimization by hand. It's no good. If the compiler understands that the loop is SIMD compatible, it will do this automatically. It knows better how to do that than you do. So try to make the compiler do it. Do not try to help. So that's the a possible pseudo assembly code that could be generated. We have a vector load of A of I into a vector register, another one of B of I into a vector register. We have the vectorized add that does the actual work. Uh, and we have a vectorized store. And then, of course, the loop counter has to be advanced by four. And if it hasn't reached its, its goal yet, we have to branch to the top of the loop. So this is how SIMD by compiler works. Now, actually, we now have all the components together to be able to calculate the peak performance of a core. And here we're talking about floating point peak performance, executing multiplies and adds. Now, to this formula, there are four terms. There's a term which we call superscalarity term, NFP super. It, it has this, um, this label of FP because we're only looking at floating point instructions. So this is the number of floating point instructions that can be executed per cycle under the best circumstances. So best pipelining, no bubbles whatsoever. The second factor called NFMA is the FMA factor. Now modern CPUs have instructions that can do a multiply and add in the same instruction. So they can uh, take three operands, A, B, and C, and calculate A plus B times C in a single instruction. If this is possible, the FMA factor is two, if it's not possible, it's one. And SIMD is the SIMD width. So this is just how many operands can fit into a SIMD register. Now, for example, with AVX 512, this number is eight if we're dealing with double precision operands. And finally, the clock speed, of course, because the higher the clock frequency, the more instructions we can execute, the higher the peak performance. In the table below, we see typical representatives of processes from Intel, AMD, and also from IBM over the years. So we are covering here a, a range of, um, well, 10 years. And you see how different things have developed. So for example, the floating point superscalarity factor has not changed at all. It's always two. So in the early Intel processes, we could execute a multiply and an add instruction per cycle. Later, this has been uh, improved, still two instructions, but now they introduced FMA. So starting with the Intel Haswell processor, um, each floating point instruction was a fused multiply add, and you could do two of them. The SIMD width has also increased in steps, of course. So up to Westmere, 2010, we had two. Then in 2012, we went to four. In 2017, we went to eight in the standard server uh, chips. AMD is a little bit slower on this side, so it has had two and four. And four came in 2019 with the AMD Zen 2. You see, the clock frequency hasn't really changed much over the years. It's between 2 and 3 gigahertz. Uh, you may know about this whole um, clock speed wall we've been running against, and uh, it's not expected that this will change much in the future, so the clock speed will not be a major factor. Still, the core peak performance has increased significantly. If you just look at Intel here over 10 years, from 11 gigaflops um, to 76 gigaflops, but you see that the main contributor to this advancement are those two factors, NFMA, which only increased once from one to two, and the SIMD factor, which went from two to four to eight. We don't know if Intel or anybody else is going to increase SIMD width even further. Um, we expect that it will not be increased anytime soon because you, you need to have code that makes use of that. And not all codes uh, actually can leverage the SIMD feature. That pretty much concludes our coverage of the core and the execution resources on the core.
Um, next, we have to take a look at the memory hierarchy of modern processors. Now, I said it before, data transfers are the number one limiting factor in computing. So if you can do anything to make your program move less data, chances are that it will get faster. Um, the main insight is that main memory is too slow to keep up with the CPU's hunger for data. If you execute any algorithm on a modern CPU that needs any kind of data that is stored in main memory, it will usually be the case that uh, the execution units, the pipelines, will have many, many bubbles because they wait for data from memory all the time. To mitigate this, um, people have invented so-called caches. Now, the insight here is that you can either build a small and fast memory, and small means really small, of the order of tens of kilobytes, or a large and slow memory. Large means, well, tens or hundreds of, of, of gigabytes, of course, in main memory, but this main memory is very really slow. So the caches are a compromise, and usually we have several levels of those. Um, in modern server CPUs, there are three, normally. Uh, they are used to hold data, which uh, is often used as close as possible to the CPU. The smaller the cache, the faster it is. Um, we have multiple levels, as I said. The outermost cache is often of the order of tens of megabytes. L2 cache is a couple of hundred kilobytes or a megabyte. And L1 cache is 32 or 64 uh, kilobytes. If any data has to be transferred from memory through the caches to the core, ultimately, this transfer always happens in bursts. And this burst is a single cache line. We call it cache line. Uh, typically, it's 64 bytes long. So whenever you need a single byte from main memory, you always get a full cache line, which is then put into the caches. And ultimately, the core reads it from the L1 cache. There's a whole science of optimizations that deals with avoiding slow data paths. So the question is, once I've got a piece of data from memory into the cache, how can I make sure that I can reuse it as often as possible before it drops out again? And many optimizations do exactly that. They try to keep data as close as possible to the CPU and avoid the slow data paths which are far away from the CPU. On the left and right of this, um, of this diagram here, we see latency and bandwidth numbers. The bandwidth is the maximum rate at which data can flow from a certain um, from a certain level. Uh, for example, in the L1 cache, we can read and write data with bandwidth of the order of terabytes per second. Uh, and you know, from memory, maybe it's just a couple of ten of gigabytes per second, and disk is even slower. The latency is a kind of setup time. It tells you how much time it takes to set up the data transfer until the first byte of data can flow. In the L1 cache, this is of the order of one or two nanoseconds. So if you issue a load and you want some data in the register, it takes a couple of CPU cycles until it actually arrives there. The L2 and L3 caches have latencies of the order of tens of cycles, and memory uh, has hundreds of cycles of latency. Now, actually, we can put these numbers, latency and bandwidth, to all data paths that are relevant in computing. And here, this is a quite comprehensive scale of data paths. It starts with the inner cache levels, high bandwidth memory, which we find typically in, um, in GPUs and uh, other accelerators, outer cache levels, main memory, high performance networks, which we will deal with later, um, standard networks like 10 gigabit Ethernet, solid state disks, and up to down to the internet. And here are the scales for latency and bandwidth. Uh, you can study them at your leisure. Now, um, why do we deal with latency and bandwidth so much? It turns out that this model uh, that in order to transfer a message, you have to wait for some time, the latency, until the data can flow. And once it flows, it flows with a maximum rate, the bandwidth. This model is actually quite powerful. It can be used to model a lot of data paths in a computer. So the transfer time for a message across a data path T is the latency lambda plus the size of the message in bytes divided by the bandwidth of the data path. So T is lambda plus N over B. This is a simple model. It's sometimes inaccurate, but it captures the qualitative nature of data transfer in a computer across many, many different data paths. So 
Um, if we know how long it takes to transfer a message, we can also calculate an effective bandwidth. So how much data can be transferred per time? This is just the size of the message uh, divided by the transfer time. With that, I'd like to conclude the coverage of the single core. I could go on and on for hours, but um, now you know enough to be able to understand the basic uh, performance limitations of the core. And you will cover a little bit more of that as we, as we go along. So here's a little summary. A single CPU core today is still a stored program computer. Um, multiple hardware optimizations are in place to boost the performance compared with the original concept. This is pipelining, out of order execution, superscalarity, simultaneous multi-threading, SIMD, which is the main driver of peak performance today, and caches. Now, even though we're dealing with a single core here, you've learned that parallelism is already built into the single core. And mostly it's addressed by the compiler and the hardware automatically, but still sometimes manual optimizations may be useful. All right, so leaving the single core, we're now advancing to parallel computer architecture. So putting multiple cores together, um, I showed you a little bit of that already in the last lecture. So, but first of all, I'd like to show you, um, well, somewhat old, probably dated classification of parallel computers. First of all, what's parallel computing? Parallel computing means that a number of compute elements solve a problem in a cooperative way, usually a numerical problem for dealing with uh, computational science. A parallel computer is a number of compute elements connected in such a way as to do parallel computing for a hopefully large set of applications. Most parallel computers are general purpose machines. There are some special purpose machines, but mostly uh, the stuff that you feel in uh, find in computing centers is uh, built for general purpose applications, a wide range. Now, in 1972, there was a famous paper by Flynn uh, that tried to classify parallel computing into four categories, and he called them SISD, MISD, SIMD, and MIMD. So the SISD is a simple stop program computer. It means single instruction, single data. So there's only one instruction at a time executed, probably with optimizations like uh, superscalarity still. And this instruction deals with a single data item or a single operation on pair or more than two operands. SIMD, single instruction multiplier, we covered that uh, today. This means that we have instructions, also called vector instructions, in the instruction set that, that uh, work on whole vectors of data. Um, so SSE, AVX, AVX512 are typical uh, names here in the x86 realm. MIMD, multiple instruction, multiple data. These are machines which can execute multiple instruction streams, independent processes or threads, in order to work cooperatively on a problem. So there are two flavors here. We cover them in, in due detail, shared memory and distributed mapping machines. So this is the main kind of architectural category that we're going to deal with here. And the fourth one is MISD, multiple instruction, single data, which doesn't really have um, a very useful application in practice. So here's our view of a multiprocessor, a multi-core computer. We have multiple instances of this stored program computer design, and these could each be uh, one of our described uh, single core designs. So we put multiple of those on a chip and put them into shared memory. So there must be some electronics, some logic in place that enables the use of a big shared memory in order to um, communicate using this shared memory between the cores. We call that a multi-core processor. Typically, these multiple cores are actually on the same chip. They could also be in the same package, but on different chips, but the distinction is not so important here. So that's what you buy in a shop. It's a multi-core processor with some infrastructure so that you can put it on a, on a motherboard, for example. This is an image of a typical uh, chip with the package removed. In order to make a system out of that, on which I can run an operating system and actual applications, I need some more infrastructure, like, for example, a memory. Um, and probably multiple of these chips are connected together. So multiple CPU chips per node. And this is what we call uh, 
a multi-core, multi-socket node. This is the building block of most high-performance computing systems today. It has a single address space that can be accessed from all cores, and this address space is actually cache coherent, meaning that if one of those cores makes a modification in one of its caches, then if another core needs that modified data, the hardware automatically takes care of that and keeps those caches in circ. This is something that happens in the hardware automatically. Now, if you want to advance to really big systems uh, that are essentially limitless in terms of performance, we have to go to distributed memory. And there we have to drop this concept of a cache coherent single address space. Now, what we could do is just um, have more of the multi-core chips and multi-core nodes, put them together and endow them with a communication network. And of course, this can uh, get very large, thousands or even millions of, of such nodes. And this is what we call a cluster or a supercomputer. Modern supercomputers are a mixture of shared and distributed memory systems. They are shared distributed memory hybrids. And this is one of the main complications when dealing with performance on those computers. You have to be aware of the underlying hierarchical architecture. So let's now look a little bit more closely to shared memory parallel computers and, and what they're good for. So in shared memory, we have a single address space, as I told you, for all processes and cores. Changes in one cache will be communicated to all others for consistency. This is called cache coherence. Now, since multiple CPUs are accessing a shared memory, it becomes very easy to uh, distribute work. Now, for example, you could imagine that a loop must be executed and different parts of the loop iteration space could then be assigned to different CPUs. Since the data is already in memory, they could just access that data directly and update it and everything would be nicely parallel. So it's a really attractive model for doing parallel computing. Things are not that easy, actually. Uh, there are two basic variants of shared memory computers, Yuma and Sisinuma. It's very important that you understand this distinction because it's, uh, it makes a big difference in terms of performance. So what is Yuma? Yuma stands for Uniform Memory Access. It means that all memory that is accessible in the shared memory system is accessible by all cores, of course, but with equal latency and bandwidth. So no matter where you are in your system, no matter whether your process is running on any of those cores, if you access memory, it doesn't matter where the memory is and where the core is, it's always the same latency and always the same bandwidth. In other words, you don't have to care where you put your memory or where you put your executing thread, it's always the same memory performance. Now, if there's uniform, there must be non-uniform, and this is what CCNUMA is all about. Uh, it stands for cache coherent non-uniform memory access. For historical reasons, we add the cache coherent here. Uh, we don't add it for Yuma systems, although they are also cache coherent. In non-uniform memory access systems, the latency and bandwidth vary depending on the mutual position of the core and the memory it wants to access. So one example is this two-socket uh, server, very common pattern. If we run a thread on one of those cores and it accesses local memory, we get a certain latency, a certain bandwidth. However, if we access data from the distant chip, so a core on the on the chip that has to go through this interchip link in order to access the data, then the latency will be higher and the bandwidth will be lower. So it takes longer to get hold of the data. And now you see how this could get really messy if you run a parallel program on all of those cores and you don't take care as to where the, the data is put that you want to access, then you could suffer huge performance losses. Now, if this is so complicated to deal with, why do we need it? Why do we have it? So why do people build non-uniform memory access systems? The answer is simple, it is easier. As you already know, memory bandwidth or memory access speed is a major factor in the performance of programs. So the faster you can access memory, the faster many algorithms will run. The memory bandwidth is just data volume divided by time. So how much time does it take to, to, to transfer a certain amount of data over the memory bus? Now, if you look at such a Sisinuma system, it's actually two Yuma systems connected via some inter-domain network. Now, if we um, 
take two of those and connect them via network, this is easier to do and also cheaper than building a huge Yuma system with the same memory bandwidth. But this is for technical reasons. Increasing the memory bandwidth is not so simple. You need to increase the number of wires, you need to increase the clock frequency on those wires. That's all a big engineering problem. It's much easier if you split the memory interface into two using those two chips and just use a network between the chips, which is not quite as fast as the memory interface because it should only be used from time to time if your program is actually optimized for that. So the advantage is it is easier and cheaper to build multiple domains with smaller bandwidth than one Yuma domain with high bandwidth. Of course, the disadvantage is that this structure adds topology, as we call it. It, is, it adds non-uniformity in the memory access, so you need to know where your threads are running and where your memory is. What about programming such systems? I'm going to give you a glimpse here what it looks like. There's more shared memory programming models than you could imagine, possibly. So there are lots and lots of, of, of solutions. In scientific computing, fortunately, there's one solution that is sort of dominant or popular, and this is OpenMP, stands for Open Multiprocessing. Uh, on this website, you can find all the details, including the, the standard definition. OpenMP consists of source code directives, so things that you endow your source code with, uh, interpreted by the compiler when compiling the code. There's also a small API, but the major part of OpenMP is actually source code directives. So let's look at an example, very simple example. We have three arrays here, A, B, and C, and a uh, double position variable S. Visualization has been left out here. And in this loop down here, we add the two arrays B and C element by element, we store the result into A, and in passing, we also accumulate all elements of A into the summation variable S. In OpenMP, if you want to do this in parallel, it's actually really simple. We have to write this line in front of the loop. Hash pragma OMP parallel for reduction and then in parens plus colon S. Now what does this mean? Pragma OMP is a so-called directive sentinel. It introduces um, a command for the compiler telling the compiler this is now where OpenMP comes in. Please look at this and interpret it in terms of op the OpenMP standard. The parallel is a so-called parallelization directive. It opens a team of threads. How many threads and where they're running, all of this stuff is actually defined somewhere else. Here at this loop, we just tell the runtime um, there should be a team of threads and they should start working on whatever comes. Now, of course, we need to specify how the work should be distributed. And this is the, the goal of the work sharing directives. The for directive that's following the parallel specifies that the iteration space in this loop should be distributed across the threads that are running. So each thread gets a part of this iteration space. Again, how exactly this is done, who gets which iteration can also be specified. But um, in the simple form, it just takes a default. And then finally, since we have a so-called reduction here, so we take all the elements of A and reduce them, we add them up into a summation variable, we can tell the compiler to do that for us. So we tell the compiler there's a summation variable and we want to add it up across all the threads. So each thread gets a, its own version of S, it's initialized with zero, they're all individually accumulated, and at the end of the parallel loop, the compiler generates code to produce the final result. So this is a simple example of a parallel loop with a reduction. There's much more to be said about OpenMP, but you see how simple it is to get to a parallel program. On our path to limitless performance, we now have to cross the border of shared memory um, systems and go to distributed memory parallel computers. Back in the day, we had so-called pure distributed memory systems. We had individual processors with exclusive local memory and an exclusive local network interface in one node. So one node comprised exactly one processor core running one process. And we had a dedicated communication network that was used to communicate between those processes. A parallel program running meant running one process per node. And data exchange was done via message passing over this network. 
This was actually a thing not so long ago. So um, about 15 years ago, we still had systems of that sort, but that ceased quickly with the advent of multi-core processors. Nowadays, distributed memory systems are much more complicated. They are hybrids, as I mentioned already, hybrids of distributed shared memory type. We have clusters of networked shared memory nodes. Each node is a Sisinuma architecture comprising multiple sockets, each socket probably comprising multiple NUMA domains. And uh, of course, we have a network interface, but the network, network interface is shared uh, between all the entities of one node. Since this system has such a strong hierarchy and such a strong topology, as we call it, we can expect strong effects in the communication performance, depending on where the communication partners are sitting. So for example, if you want to send a message from one core to another core on the same socket or the same NUMA domain, probably sharing a common cache, then this will be very fast. If you want to send a message within the node, so still within the shared memory, but between different NUMA domains, this will be slower because there's no direct connection. The message has to be put through main memory to be communicated. And finally, if you want to communicate between cores on different nodes, you actually have to utilize the network interface and the communication network. To make this even worse, um, the performance of this operation may also depend on where exactly the sending core may be. So if the sending core is um, sitting in a NUMA domain, which is close to the network interface, it could be faster than what is shown here, where the sender is in a NUMA domain, which is far away from the network interface. And on top of that, to not let it be too simple, uh, we could still have effects from the network structure. So the communication network itself could have a substructure that makes it faster for some nodes to communicate than for others. So how do we deal with this distributed memory parallel programming? Again, many models exist. Um, the dominant model in high performance scientific computing is MPI, the message passing interface. If you want to read, in the, uh, read the standard, you can look it up in the MPI forum uh, website. MPI, as opposed to OpenMP, is a library standard. So it's completely defined in terms of library functions. There are several open and commercial implementations. For example, um, on our clusters in Erlangen, we have Intel MPI, which is commercial. Um, but there's also Open MPI, which is open source. And there are a couple of others. Now, what is the basic idea of MPI? The idea is that processes communicate via message transfers. So whenever I want to communicate with a different process, running a different processor, I have to call the library in order to do that. The library is unfortunately very large. It has hundreds of functions, and it's significantly more complex to handle than OpenMP. On the other hand, if you don't want to handle two program models, it's entirely possible to address this complicated hierarchical hybrid system with just MPI. You can use MPI on shared memory without any problems. And usually, at least for high performance implementations, MPI will know that the other communication partner is sitting on the same shared memory and will actually employ shared memory data exchange for this kind of communication. Now here on the right, we see a simple example. It doesn't do anything useful. It just starts the program, and then every one of the processes uh, says, hello world, I am uh, rank of size. So the principle here is that we have to start uh, a program with MPI in it. This is initial, like initialization the parallel of the parallel machine. With MPI com size, we get as an output parameter the size of the MPI program, so how many processes are actually running. Again, similar to OpenMP, this is specified somewhere else. And I just can, I can request it from the program, but how many processes are actually started? This is uh, the business of the runtime, and I have to do that when I start the program. With MPI com rank, every process gets a unique ID starting from zero that identifies that process. So in the simplest case, you can use the rank to determine who should do what. Now, in this simple example, we're not doing anything, just everybody prints hello world. I am rank of size. And then at the end of every MPI program, you have to finalize the parallel machine to have a well-defined state at the end. So this is probably the simplest MPI program. It's like the hello world of MPI programs.
And of course, there's much more to that, and we will come to that in due time. All right, a little summary on parallel computer architecture. Modern systems have abundant parallelism on multiple levels. We have multiple, multi-core, multi-numa domain, and multi-node. Modern clusters are also a mixture of shared and distributed memory architectures. So shared memory on the node, threading parallelism properly, and distributed memory between the nodes. Now, programming models are 10 a penny, but we're dealing here with OpenMP and MPI. OpenMP for shared memory based on threads and compiler directives, and uh, for distributed memory, MPI based on a library definition and on processes communicating via messages. That's it for today. Thank you.